Well, of course, it is this day. This day, the Feast of St. Theobald of Rogerio. It's important to ask who St. Theobald of Rogerio was. Well, he was a good guy. I know saints are not always perfect. And they're often quite horrible people to get to the sainthood. You sometimes have to, you can be a saint by doing horrible things. But St. Theo was an admirable person. All he wanted to do was help. All he ever did was good. He didn't do any action that would cause any harm to anyone. He was a he was the first hospital porter, basically. You hospital porter's pride and dignity. Stop the new world order. Welcome to her Pangmo TV. Welcome to this Saint Theo 2022. That's right. Uh, it's not Saint Theo's day today. Today is actually the 30th. It's uh, just two more days to go. Wednesday is actually Saint Theo's day, which is June the first. June the 1st is the feast day of St. Theobald of Rogerio, the patron saint of hospital porters. A day, well, basically, where well, hospital porters can get together, make merry, celebrate, take pride and dignity, assess the year that's gone ahead, hope for the year, to, sorry, assess the year that's just passed, hope for the year that's coming. Uh, this new hospital porter in the year that begins on June 1st. And, uh, well, it's gone off to a good start. There's a chap over there, outside Co-op Rosehill, He's with the air ambulances, and um, he's been... Um, he actually stopped me, and I had a nice long conversation with him, actually. Um, he was raising money for um, Oxford, Oxfordshire Air Ambulance. It's uh, based at RAF Benson and at uh, the John Radcliffe, which is my hospital. And uh, I, I said to him, oh yeah, I was a porter there for 23 years. I worked lots, alongside you guys all the time, and we had a long conversation. In the end, he, he wanted to raise money, which is fair enough. I mean, I just told him I, I was going to give him some cash. He says, no, we only do direct debits. So I said, I'm sorry, I only do cash. And he said, yes, yeah. that's all right. So you see, uh, the cash, the charities are now hit with the cash to society. Um, Oxfordshire Air Ambulance now does no longer accept cash for donations. Oh, yeah. So there you have it. Um, the air ambulance is actually essential, actually, in a saved a lot of lives, getting people to the hospital uh, quickly, um, avoiding the traffic, getting to places where the, excuse me, where road ambulances can't go. Um, so that's that's quite something. Uh, so I wish them luck, I really do. What I'm going to do now is I've got to go to, I've got to go to John Radcliffe and uh, drop off some flies for my proud and dignified brother porters. And I've got to go to the uh, the Nuffield. What's it called? I forgot the name of the hospital now. Oh, God, I forgot what it's called now. The private hospital next door and drop off some flies from my brother Porters. Then I've got to go to the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre and drop off a fly for my brother Porters. And I've got to go to the Churchill Hospital and drop a flyer off for my, you guessed it, yeah, you know the rest. Um, the problem is that um, I've, got to do so I've just suddenly had some overtime dumped on me. Now it wasn't, it was purely voluntary, I could have said no, but if I had said no, it would cause a lot of problems for people, um, including a lady who's just had a hip replacement. So I said yes. So I've got to, I'm actually going to do, I've got to work for another hour and a half before I do that. So there you have it. That's life, I'm afraid. Not to worry. It's an easy dog, it's an easy dog walking job anyway, so it's not, it's no big deal. I'm not digging holes for potatoes and all these, like that thing I did when I was fainting. Do you remember when I fainted last year? Yeah, that's not that, it's not that at all. Anyway, guys, um, I'm just um, sitting here for a few minutes because I do have a brief rest. <sighs> before that overtime begins, so uh, see you later. Okay guys, I'm on Dean Road. I'm actually recreating <coughs> a journey I used to take actually when I lived in Littlemore. And I used to walk to the hospital. I used to go this way. When I moved sort of like to into where I am now, it was easier to go. I don't know if you know Oxford very well, but it's easier to go along the Ifley Road and through East Oxford and St. Clements up into Headington. It's, and, but so uh, that change of, location changed my route entirely to to my to my uh, duties because um that's the way oxford is that's the way your geography works anyway um i think what better way to celebrate saint theo's day than to watch a hospital portering movie now that's not how i very often um, celebrate saint theo's day because hospital portering movies there's only a handful of them a very small number and they tend to be very very bad they tend to be either patronising, such as the Disorderly Orderly, uh, with Jerry Lewis, or they portray hospital porters as evil, such as Michael Elphick's character 
in David Lynch's The Elephant Man. <coughs> um, I've, done, I've, I've done an entire article on this, actually, hospital reporters in the media. But I discovered a film, which is really weird, because I consider it almost the ultimate hospital portering movie. And you know what? It's, it's not about hospital porters. All the people in it are civilians. No one's in a hospital. It's, it's weird. But I'm talking about a, a film called The World's End. It's by, directed by Edgar Rice. Stars uh, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And uh, it's, it's part of the Cornetto trilogy, this informal series of films which that team put together. Um, it's, it's strange. I mean, obviously there are themes in it relating to alien invasion and things like that, which the other Panwo blogs readers would be more interested in. But I'm going to focus on the hospital portering elements of this. Now, as I said, how can it be hospital portering? There's no, there's no hospital porters in it. Well, the characters within it are sort of archetypal hospital portering type characters you know you've got the loud exuberant alcoholic with a heart of gold deep down <coughs> you have the sort of middle class dropout who's basically had some kind of nervous breakdown at university and ended up doing hospital portering his whole his whole life um you have the sort of like small stature kind of know-it-all who's yeah for him hospital portering is just one long stream of gossip and of course you have other types, you have the serial relievers, which I talked about previously. Serial relievers are a strange bunch, actually. You know, it's, I think I did cover this on a previous St. Theo's video, but um, I mean, the, the loud exuberant alcoholics tend to be, some of them are serial relievers, but usually it's the kind of like the, the, the know-it-all types who want to go up the ladder. It's, well, it's a weird, it's a weird sort of thing because um, the serial reliever is not one of these up the ladder types. The, ser the serial reliever, well, just, re just refresh your memory. A serial reliever is a hospital porter who basically, s who spends his entire working life in the hospital portering service. <coughs> but strangely, almost inexplicably, he has this strange habit, this really weird habit. Every four or five years, he will leave hospital portering claiming he's, gonna, he's, he's gone forever and he'll do another job he'll move into another job he will do that job for about six months and then come back into hospital portering why? I, I'd never understood I've never understood the serial relievers mentality I really haven't I mean it's really because it's, a, it's actually a quite precarious thing to do if you're going to be a, like a career lifer you know you've got to because you leave and you, there's no guarantee you'll get back in they might not let you back in. <clears throat> um, there's also, you also break your service, so you lose all your incremental long service benefits. So why, why serial relievers? If there's any watching this, why do you do what you do? It's really weird. Um, anyway, but uh, I suppose the, the reason the, the world's end, of course, it's about a group of middle-aged men who, who meet up and go on a pub crawl as a, as a part of a reunion. I suppose, it is this relationship to the demon drink. Alcoholic drink is the cornerstone of hospital portering culture. It's almost as if we're we're a profession of Irishmen. Some of us are Irish, actually. You know, it's like whether it's a, a wild bender at the Park End Club on your first night off, or a quick a wondering if you can get away with a shot of vodka on your night shift afternoon, or battling a hangover at four in the morning when you're getting up for your six to two. It, whatever it is, it's um, you know your your relationship to the demon drink is going to be central to your experience of being a hospital porter. And, um, you know, there are... I was going to try and make a joke... I, I was try, urgently trying to think of a joke about a teetotal hospital porter, but I can't. You know, it's like... Uh, I'll, think, I'll think of one, something witty to say about a teetotal hospital porter. Like, yeah, it's like a unicorn, you know. Non-existent. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, I, I do like a drink myself, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a teetotal, I do like a little drink now and again, but, you know, by hospital pouring standards, I am mean, virtually abstinent. Hmm. So, do watch The World End. I mean, if, if you could just see it through that lens, and maybe it's because hospital pouring films tend to be so bad, that I look, I look for hospital pouring themes in almost everything I see. I mean, obviously the TV series Porters, which I covered on a, a, on a different video, that's, apart from my book, Evansland, that's the only, it's the only out, media outlet, the only media production I can think of in all the arts in which hospital portrait is portrayed respectfully. 
like we're going to get some rain. So I'll put my jacket on again. But uh, yeah, do watch that. It's a good film. Well worth watching. Nip into this little here in Lye Valley. Oh, this is where the big. This is where the Bigfoot is. <laughs> I don't know. Did I ever make a? Did I make a film with Nick Hayes about that? I can't remember. But uh, Nick Hayes did counter a Bigfoot down here. So if I see one, I'll let you know. Anyway, yeah, uh, the world's end. Get get the beers in. Watch it. It's a hymn to the hospital portering spirit. And well, this is. A, I think this is an important St Theo's Day because it's the first one. Um, post lockdown. The, all, all the previous the previous two have been under lockdown. If you remember the videos I made about them. And so this is actually the first time I've actually done this drop off for a while. I, I did a belated one last year where I dropped off the, the flyers. I'm actually heading for the Churchill Hospital right now to drop off my first flyer. Um, I'm doing them in a different order from last time. Um, but uh, I have been keeping in touch with my brothers and sisters on the inside in the hospital portering service and about what how they've been coping and uh my goodness makes it a bit overgrown here um and just seeing how they're getting on and things like that just looking at how they're getting on it's taking an interest in their welfare and um i think like everyone else they've they've coped with it as best they can i think they have shown i think the my brother and sister porters have shown a huge amount of stoicism and bravery in the face of this onslaught. And I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the stuff I talk about on the other Hapanwo blogs, but basically, whatever the cause, whatever the source of this, whether it's real or fake or anything like that, it's been a difficult thing for them to deal with. And they have, they have risen to that challenge very well. They have. And I'm proud of them. I'm proud to be one of them. All right, now where do I go from here? I can't remember. I think that's you've got along here. There's a, br other, there's a bridge. Oh, this has all changed. Hmm. Um, it's, it's not a, it's not an easy thing they've had to put up with. It's not an easy thing they've done, but they've done it. It's something I, I there's a part of me that thought, oh damn it, why am I not involved? It's just, see, it's something I drilled for many times. When I was in a portrait, I, I drill, I did drills many, many times. So I can't actually get along here. I think I have to go back to that bridge. Um, never did it for real. Never did quarantines uh, and, uh, you know, isolation wards on things like that on this scale. Never. And um, I used to wonder what it would be like to do for real. There's a part of it, there is a part of me that sort of regrets not being involved in that, you know, with its professional pride. You know, it would have been something, it would have been a professional challenge for me along with it as it has been for my brother and sister Porters and um, to have lost that I suppose I do feel a little bit of regret and I mean you might think well that's not very nice Ben considering well, all, all the destruction it caused but it's rather like you know it's like a, a soldier sometimes you know longs for war and says you know it'd be nice to, you know despite the awful nature of it you know it's something that he's trained for it's something that he's planned for it's just it's in a case of simply, it's just simply a case of selfish professional satisfaction. That's all I can put it down to. And I'm similar. And never, never got to do it for real. But uh, the porters, porters, porters win. Porters bat last. And uh, good, I say, good. That you enjoy this little bit now. Um, let me know if you if I did make a video with Nick Hayes. Let me know. I know I was planning to make one with him. Oh, sure I did. Anyway, see you later. Oh, it's a bit spooky down here. So I've got no idea where I'm going. Uh, the paths are all changed since I last walked down here. Used to be able to walk up onto here. I don't know if you still can. Anyway, I'm just going to follow this one. It's going in generally the right direction. Um, well, uh, news about the. Uh, Oxrad Porters, Mighty, have taken them over. M-I-T-I-E. Have you ever heard of them? Uh, it's one of these biggest companies in the world you've never heard of. They're one of these old companies, actually. Um, public service contractor. They have only over 200 contracts, including cleaners for the Royal Opera House. Um, and all kinds of things. They're rather like, you know, you know there's some are infamous, like Carillion and Group 4. But, um, or G4S, or whatever they're called nowadays. Um... Mighty are less well known. They're less well known than those 
those are notorious figures from history yet uh, they're about they're sort of the same thing really they're really the same thing the uh, these contractors the outsourcing they're outsourced from a government department various government operations they the governments do this all the time they're outsourced they outsource all their operations so they basically have plausible deniability if anything goes wrong and indeed uh, they're the rules you know they can get around a lot of rules legal loopholes and things like that by using contractors this is why when uh, governments pull out of countries you know like they pull the troops out of afghanistan afghanistan iraq bosnia who do they leave behind oh civilian contractors but these are like mercenaries so they're basically there to, to, to fight the war as the soldiers of fortune but because they're they're not actually technically troops they're, they're not they're, the same rules don't apply to them you see what i mean uh, hospitals, you know, the NHS hospitals, healthcare does exactly the same thing. It means they can uh, do a lousier job, get away with doing a lousier job with a shoddier service, and um, to be in to be contracted out to be basically privatised like this is an awful thing. It's a horrible situation for a porter to be in, or well, indeed anyone who's in that sit any any member of staff who's in that situation. Whatever you, whether you're a hospital porter or civilian, it's a terrible situation to be in. At least now you have retention of employment, protection of retention of employment, transfer of undertakings. Uh, when I first got privatised, when ISS Medically took over, I was, you know, I was I was made redundant. I had to reapply for my job. It's uh, it was dark. This is very spooky, actually. Yeah, it's just a. It's, it's painful to, to see this happening again. Now, what happened was, I mean, I've talked before about the Carillion debacle. This biggest company in the world you've never heard of went bust. But the porters were, reten were retained under... The porters were harmed. The actual, the actual porters themselves were not affected because they were NHS employees. They were employed by the NHS, seconded to Carillion PLC. All that happened was they suddenly found themselves without any management and the NHS had to hurriedly form a management structure to deal with it. But, you know, the, the, didn't didn't affect the ports at all. Now, I thought they'd learned, I was beginning to think, it was stupid of me really, that they'd learned their lesson. That they did this because they'd learned their lesson. That the government somehow realised, <laughs> well, I don't think they cared much, it's just because there was a public scandal when after 5,000 people died of MRSA. <laughs> because of the insanitary levels of cleanliness in the hospital because of the crappy companies they got in to do the cleaning um i thought well they, they now, they're not going to do this again now but all they were doing was waiting for the heat to die down and they'll just pull exactly the same stunt they pull the exact same stunt i'll just go up here now it's like one of those choose your own adventure books isn't it Ooh. um somewhere up there's the churchill hospital i can even see it so we're going in generally the right direction. Um, what a what a nightmare! I mean, oh, someone's put a handy little bridge thing here over the mud. That's good. Right, um, so hi history is repeating itself. What was it Einstein said? The definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. But they're doing it. The exact ingredients, it's raining hard now, that were the cause of the disaster originally. <laughs> they're just putting straight back into the mixing bowl and they're stirring up another crap fest pie. Can you believe? Can you believe it? Unfortunately, I can believe it. That's a problem. I can't bloody believe it. So we're nearly there. It's going up a steep hill now. I can believe it, that's the problem. Oh, I'm out in the open now. That's the thing. Oh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, we're going to get wet. Yeah. Hello, doggies. We've got a long way to go. Oh, dear. Hello, doggies. Hello. Um, and, uh, I know I should, my first thought should be, well, it doesn't affect you, Ben, you're out of it. No, no. 
One's a hospital porter, always a hospital porter. What hurts hospital porter hurts me. And so it caused me enormous distress when I heard that the mighty were taking over the Oxrad porters. Enormous distress. And I'm um, sure I'll be, I'll be hearing more about that, no doubt, when I go and see the porters later on when we have our little reunion. So here I am at the Churchill Hospital now. I'm on the right track. This is the flyer here, since the O2022. That's the hospital porter and symbol. Nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. And then the Roosevelt, and there's the location. If any of you want to join us, um, you'll be glad to. St. Theobald of Rogerio. It's a background to... Um, St. Theo, St. Theo himself, in association with the panel and the HPWA. So it's blowing, it's blowing around in the wind a little bit. There you go, the panel, the HPWA. Oh, this has all changed. I've just come out of the Churchill Hospital. It's still being built. Covid swabbing. Oh man, it's uh, this bit's original, but oh, this is all new. We've not seen this before. Um, I'm going to get over on the other pavement. But I'm, I'm on top of the world, man. I'm over the moon. <laughs> I, I, I first I missed the worst of the rain while I was in the hospital. Secondly, I've just met Mad Mick. Oh man, I can't believe it. It's like um, I went into the, the I went in from where you last saw me. I'm showing you the flyer, and I went into the uh, <laughs> I went into the into the main entrance of the porter's lodge was there, and um, I saw the doors open. I went in and said, "Brother Porters, I've come to drop this off here." So, oh, thanks. Oh, it's you, Ben, he said. I looked around, there was this, this skinny old man with a coof mask on. And I said, Mick, it's you. I said, Mick. I couldn't believe it, man. I just couldn't believe it. This is a guy I've not seen. He actually left the JR before I did. And he's been at the church all this time. I didn't know. I thought, I thought he dropped out of the service. And he was a refuse porter. He was a guy I knew very well, actually. He was a refuse porter at the uh, JR when I started, and um, I became very good friends with him. Not seen him for ages, um, and he's, he's, he, he looks so old. He said, I said, he said, look at me, I've got old, and I said, well, that's, that's what the Churchill does to you, mate. <laughs> I'm not going to bother dropping in the, the ambulance station this year. Stick strictly to porters, I think, this year. Um, the, the, the ambulance service never showed any interest in, in uh, St. Theo's anyway, so that's that. But can you, I just thought it was unbelievable. He said, what's more, what's more, he remembered the last ones. He says, oh, well, I'll put it up on the notice board. I've done that every year. And I thought, what? What do you mean every year? Yeah, they, they, those times when I went around dropping off the St. Theo's fly, there was no one there. They picked them up they, and Mick remembers them. And so hopefully they'll, hope, so hopefully they'll be some of the Churchill lads down on Friday. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic, I can see old Mad Mick again. And, and he's introduced me to a couple of his brother porters who were there, people I didn't know. And um, we had a long conversation about portering and things like that and about how it's all gone downhill. But, you know, and then he says, well, I might retire, but I'll come, you know, I'll come back in three days a week or something. <laughs> I thought, he, he cannot give it up. He can't give it up. <laughs> it's a love-hate relationship, you see, we have. We, we hospital porters, we have a very love-hate relationship with the service we're a part of, what we're in, what we are, what we do. As I say, it's not a job. It's not a job. Flipping burgers at McDonald's is a job. Stacking boxes in Tesco's is a job. Hospital portering service is the hospital portering service. It's what we are, it's what we do. Porters pride and dignity. I mentioned actually something else because I saw a news headline about David Fuller. You may have heard of him, he's a bit inf infamous. He's the bedsit killer. The bedsit killer. Um, David Fuller, um, in 1987, he murdered two young women who lived in his house, his lodgers, and um, dumped their bodies. Now, uh, he was arrested in 2019, but they found out when they arrested him, they did a search on his computer and they found out that he had thousands of hours of obscene material on there. And a lot of, the, a lot of this obscene material was him sexually... Uh, abusing corpses in the mortuary at the hospital. You see, he um, he actually, they said he was a hospital worker, right? And I thought, oh God, oh dear. When they say, whenever they say hospital worker, that's always a bad sign. Because they, it's usually a euphemism for something you'll be a bit more familiar with. 
but I scroll through it and it, it went through all, all it went into some of the disgusting details of what this filthy man has done. I mean, at least unlike with Jimmy Savile, they were uh, dead and didn't know anything about it. And um, oh, and then, and then he, thank you, and then um, he. I scrolled down through the article and then I thought, I bet you everyone, when they see a hospital worker, they get this far, they can think, oh right, a lot of people, oh, you see Ben, what you porters are like. But then, when I got to the bottom, it, it, he was actually a technical assistant on the estates department. Get it? He was not a porter, all right? He was not a porter. Do I make that, do I make myself clear? Yeah. The rain's starting again. This is all new as well. This here used to be the park hospital. Um, you can see a little bit of the original architecture there, but it's been done up considerably. It's now Boundary Brook House. Like many of the old Oxford hospitals, it's been, been, it's been sold to the university and converted into research, clinical trials for search government. So like the RA, it's still a hospital of sorts. It'll still be admitting patients, but only for research purposes, not general clinical, um, which is kind of some consolation. Um, maybe I'll say more about the Radcliffe Infirmary another time. I'm down at the knock, um, nothing will speed at centre. Now you see these gates, they've still got these gates here. I got, I got really drunk one night at the knock social club and I squeezed underneath these gates <laughs> because they, they were locked, I wanted to get out of it because I used to live down this way. And um, I squeezed under these gates. I couldn't do that now. <laughs> After the knock, it's got a weird kind of circular motif. They call this bit the Starship Enterprise, I can see why. Anyway, I just I went into there and uh, I just went in the engine and I saw this guy sort of mooching around looking quarter-like. And he had the he had the uniform G4S. Now the, the uniform's slightly different from the Churchill, so I wasn't entirely sure G4S might have a civilian contract here as well. But I said, look, hey, so buddy. Young Asian chap. Yeah. And I says, you're poor too. He says, yeah. <laughs> he looks a bit nervous. And I said, I've got something for you. All right, all right. And he, he sort of like edged back a little. <laughs> Look scared. I think that's all right. Something nice. And I handed him the St Theo's fly, and he says, "All right, thanks." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, I used to be one too." I, he says, "Yeah." When he said, oh, "Yeah, hey, I'm a porter," I said, oh, "Good. I used to be one too." And um, I, uh, <laughs> he sort of looked at. He says, "Oh, thanks." Uh, something I, sh I should. I forgot to mention a little while ago, when I was at the Churchill. Um, this is something more. It's more to do with. The other element, the other Hapanmo blogs, but I noticed that, like, when I was a porter, like, there the, the, was like a senior porter who acted as controller. Sometimes he'd have like a desk porter, basic grade, as a dispatcher. And they called them dispatchers later on. I prefer just like desk porter, but a lot of the old terminology was done away with. And um, <coughs> he'd take jobs, would be taken by phone call direct to the porter's lodge where the dispatcher or, or desk porter or senior was. And he'd write them down a piece of paper, put them in a logbook, and hand us the bits of paper. You know, handwritten bit slips of paper. There's like a box on the wall with numbers. Now in the lodge, big electronic thing. And um, this quite shocked me. I was, I was so happy meeting Mad Mick and like having a chat with him that I forgot about this bit. I forgot all about this. Um, there's like a fingerprint scanner, and the porters have to. When the, when the job comes through on the screen, the porters have to put their f forefinger on this scanning pad. And, well, for reasons I talk about in the other Hapanmo blogs, you know, that really disturbs me. You know, I think, I, I, would, I wouldn't have, I'd have felt very uncomfortable doing that myself. I'd probably, I probably wouldn't have done it. Because, of course, then I'd probably get kicked in. So I, th I think my discharge was inevitable from hospital port, even if it hadn't been for the reasons, or m made up reasons, that they actually got rid of me. I'd have probably been kicked out for another reason anyway, <laughs> between now and then. But um, anyway, that's the knock done. Just, just two more now. It's the, uh, the hospital, I, I can't remember its name, and they're the John Radcliffe, a name I'll never forget. So it's raining again, but there you go. It won't, a bit of rain it takes more the rain to put a hospital porter off what he wants to do. Yeah. I'm standing outside the Headington Conservative Club. Now, one time, many, many years ago, 
um, I was walking past here on my way to a night shift and someone from inside called me and they came out and they said come in I, I know because they saw my uniform and everything they said come in come in come in I said all right what is it and they pointed and there was one of our wheelchairs one of our one of our ward wheelchairs was in was in there <laughs> I thought okay he said, can you get rid of this for us, please? Take it to the hospital. I said, yeah, sure. So I wheeled it all the way up here up Windmill Road, <laughs> through the car park and into the JR. <laughs> uh, when I told the senior what I'd done, he said, well, how am I going to put that on the log? Because by then we were using computerized logs and there was limited, you know, there were limited options for job, ty job types, destinations and things like that, or sources. So, how exactly do I how exactly do I put that on there? How do I write this job down? I just put, in the end he just put car park to a level two lodge, wheelchair, car park to a level two lodge, empty wheelchair. It's odd, isn't it? You know. There's been several other uh, weird uh, cases I've done. Um, now with the there were different code words for different levels of urgency that were different types of jobs. For instance, PAT Pats, that was patient. Uh, PAT just meant a routine patient transfer, PAT U meant an urgent patient transfer, and PAT E, with an E, meant patient emergency. It was an emergency patient transfer. Now I was a court to, of all places, the, the area we call Rose Cottage, which is the place where David Fuller used to make those horrible videos. Um, and what happened was the, the manager of the PM suite, and of course he was quite a character, I'll tell you a few stories about him, um, he was actually in a really bad way, he was ill. He was in terrible pain, he was suffering from terrible abdominal pains. And um, so they said, get, I've got to get, I was in a wheelchair, I had a wheelchair with me. There was another porter already there, some new guy, he didn't know what to do. So I said, get onto, the, get onto the wheelchair. And he sort of got on there and he was like almost falling off. The other guy had to hold him on. I couldn't have done it on my own. He was in absolute agony and I wheeled him to the accident emergency and uh, when the job was entered onto the onto the log, onto the computer log, it said Pat E, uh, PM, E, A, E, Major. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Pat E, PM, urgent PM, emergency patient from the mortuary, emergency patient from the mortuary to A and E Major. I mean, what what the hell are the auditors going to think of that? <laughs> oh, that's another amazing anecdote there from the annals of hospital portion. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm now heading up Windmill Road in Headington now. And here actually is the children's air ambulance store. Although it was actually General Air Ambulance, the guy outside Co-op Rose Hill was raising money for. Um, I should explain actually the air ambulance is actually a helicopter. It's not a, a jump jet or a anti-gravity to disc or anything like that for the Nazis. It is a helicopter. Alright guys, so I'm now heading down through, through the Headington shops and uh, this is an area that was very familiar to me. This was the, uh, there used to be a, un, there used to be a subway here with paintings and things in. It's gone now, it's been replaced by an overground thing, an overground crossing, which is a shame. It's like they're smelly though. Private hospital now, it's called the Manor Hospital. Um, I'm surprised I could have forgotten that actually, because it's built on the site of the old Manor football ground, which was Oxford United's ground before they moved to the Kassam Stadium. Um, this road actually used to be, I used to walk up here when I used to watch matches occasionally and that building there is actually a part of the original stadium, um, it's the only bit left. The hospital up here, it's, it's, the reason I got Nuffield is because it's part of the Nuffield group, it's a private healthcare company and um, this is the hospital up here where the football ground used to be. That's the hospital there of course, the Manor Hospital Oxford, Nuffield Health, that's why I got them mixed up with Nuffield, Nuffield Health. Um, I just went in there, um, it's very grand in there because it's a private hospital, they actually have to make the place look good uh, for a kind of a, a, for a real reason rather than a fake reason like the John Radcliffe does. They're not actually trying to fool anyone, they're just literally trying to present a good image. The, 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 the nice, the poshness of the NHS hospitals is uh, essentially a smokescreen, it's painting over the rust, it's intended to fool the, the patient who is not a customer but is forced to use the product. Um, I didn't see any porters, I mean porters generally aren't on public display in private hospitals like that, they have, they had a receptionist, they probably do have, I don't know if they have night shift porters there on 
the reception I'm not sure it's not it doesn't have an emergency service so it's quite likely there is no there is no reception service at night um, so probably not anyway it'll hope it, I gave it to the reception lady and I hope it will find its way to the porters definitely she may even be inspired herself I hope so anyway I'm just gonna head now for the final stop on my mission the good old JRH my hospital the place where I served for all my 23 years in hospital portering in this one hospital okay I've just come out of the women's center <laughs> used to be called JR Maternity until they moved gynaecology from the Churchill into level one and it became the women's sense of caring for women, it says on there. It's, it's very, there's a lot of feminism in this business, unfortunately. But I just uh, popped in there. You can't just walk in there anymore, no, now. Um, you've got like, there's like a, a cordon. You've got to like report in via an electronic voice box. And uh, then they open the door for you to let you in. <laughs> Someone at the other end lets you in. Uh, and it's not the porter either. The porter's, the porter's reception's gone. The porter's lodge is still there, luckily. And there's like a dispatcher. Uh, I actually had a, well, I won't name him, but I had a brief discussion with a, a person, a uh, senior porter, and um, which was nice. Um, that, that happened last time I came this way, I remember. And I've come out now and I'm going back across this green space. It's the only green space left in a damn hospital. And they used to play cricket on here. Oh god! Even that's what's that? What the hell is that? What the hell is that? I don't believe it. Something they built. This used to be the cricket field, and they just built something on there. Oh my god! There's a windsock. It's a bloody helicopter landing pad. Oh dear! I didn't realise they they had the original helicopter landing pad was over on the by the west wing, and they moved. Maybe they've got two now. I don't know. Oh. Shit. How silly, how silly. Anyway, this here is our sanctuary house, which is the staff accommodation. And uh, this low-lying building, well, I've, I've told you this before, it used to be the social club. It's now occupational health. And there's a couple of new buildings here that I've not seen before. They weren't here when I, when I first arrived. Oh. One is this little outhouse here for the Occy Health, which is a Koof area, I believe. And let's have a look. Yeah, here we go. Centre for Occupational Health and Wellbeing. Ugh. Health and Wellbeing. Like they give a damn about our health and wellbeing. We're just disposable commodities. We're human resources to them. Yep, this is like a, a coof centre. Which has been set up here. Staff testing area. Here we go. Now this building here, I've not seen before. The last time I came here, which was two years ago, this was not there. It wasn't even being, it must have, they must have built it very quickly in the last two years. Um, it is the Ronald McDonald house chart. It's, oh, good grief. More like the it clown. That there is half the sanctuary house, which is still the same. That's uh, staff accommodation. I toyed with the idea of getting a room there once when I was young and I wasn't getting along with my parents and I was living with them. Um, but gee, it's not, it's quite a nice crack in there actually, it's alright, although uh, you do uh, sometimes, you've got, sometimes you've, you've got to keep quiet because obviously people are sleeping, people are sleeping at different times in there because they're on different shifts, so if, you're, if you have neighbours who are not very appreciative of that, then um, it can be a bit difficult. Because you, you might be sleeping, you know, some people sleep in the day, some in the afternoon, some in the morning, it's just like some night normally, you know. It's, but anyway, it's, it's got it's a nice atmosphere there. Um, it was nice to see uh, see my brother Porter again. And um, I dropped off my final set of flies. I've, I've got two flies for JR actually. <coughs> um, so this is, he's going to distribute so this uh, friend of mine. Uh, another this is another Porter who shall remain nameless. You, I've got to. It's sad, you know, that you've got to protect these people by not telling them who they are. Like they're. It's a sad, it's a sad state of affairs and a bad sign for society where honest, honest men have to behave like criminals, hide themselves away, you know, not reveal their names and stuff like that. What's happening? What's happening to this world? Oh, I used to walk out of here, I remember. So, some of my service I used to walk out of here because I used to live down in St. Clements and I always used to, well, also I used to walk in here when I when I moved to Cowley. So I was in St. Clements first, then Littlemore, 
than Cowley. When I was in Littlemore, I used to come in through the, through the um, Osler Road entrance. When I was in St. Clements, then later on when I was in Cowley, I uh, was in tw 2011, I moved in there, just before I got kicked out. And then I used to come in through this entrance here, which is the, this, this road here. And here we will show you the sign in a minute. Mm. The John Radcliffe Hospital. The biggest teaching hospital, the biggest hospital I think now in the country. It's expanded enormously in the time I was there. <laughs> Dozens of times the size <laughs> that, uh, that many other hospitals are. And um, yeah, it's just got all, most of what was at the Radcliffe Infirmary has gone there. And here we are, Woodlands Road. Oxford and this one is Sandfield Road, Woodlands and Sandfield Road. And there's a little alleyway here which I'll show you in a minute, I'll show you the alleyway. <clears throat> I was just thinking like um I don't know how many of you are fond of ghost stories. Spooky stuff, things that go bump in the night. And sometimes in the day as well. Well um there's a YouTube video that's worth what there's a YouTube channel I recommend. It's called The Darkest Secret. And um Here's the alleyway going up and down here. Um, <coughs> oh yes, I used to come out of here in the morning and I'd be like, oh, after a night shift, and I'd be, Ugh. my cheeks would be down here by my chin. And I'd be like, oh, I want to go, oh, I couldn't hardly speak. Um, yeah, the darkest secret is by a Mexican lady who had these very well put together compilations of ghost videos, and she did one recently on hospital ghosts. Now, hospital ghosts are very common. Um, now, whether you believe in them or not. Um, Whatever the reason you think people see them, if, if you don't, if you don't think they're real, or presumably you, you, people must think they're seeing them for a reason. Whatever the, I, I personally do believe in ghosts, but if you don't, fair enough. Um, why do people see them? You've got to ask yourself more in hospitals than anywhere else. Um, but they're, they're, to be honest, in all 23 years within the walls of that hospital, I can honestly say I never saw anything definitively spooky. I never did. However, lots of other people did. And I heard quite a few ghost stories in my time. One of the most remarkable was um, <coughs> there was this. Uh, I came I came on duty for a night shift on A and E, and everyone was talking about something that happened a couple of hours earlier, around 8 p.m. Where in the clinical decisions unit, which is like a part of A and E, really, they just call it that so they can say they've beaten the, <laughs> they just say they've beaten the targets uh, for, for for transfer. Um, a nurse ran out of there screaming and she'd seen some kind of spectral apparition and no one knows exactly what was the cause of this but she swore it was real she swore it was real and everyone was talking about it you know but um when i came on night shift a lot that when they were handing over all the staff were talking about it but um the nurses hand over like an hour before we do and they were talking about it that's what i mean but um the uh there was someone being worked on about 40 feet away in the rhesus area, there was someone being worked on, on they were doing CPR on somebody, and um, maybe it's connected to a near-death experience or something like that, if you believe in those things. I do, but you might not, but fair enough. Um, there's actually a, a doctor from the United States called Dr. Mitchell Gibson. Um, he's got a sort of black guy with big ears. Strange looking chap. Um, but he's a really, really interesting bloke because he's, he was a doctor at a hospital in New York City, and he would meet, regularly meet up with the spirits of the departed patients he'd been trying to save. Hmm. That's really quite, a, quite an amazing thing. Anyway, in this video by Leonora Clay, this darkest secret YouTube channel, she talks about um, ghosts being seen in the mortuary, things like that, and you know, where the, the dead bodies are. And it's, it, is, it does go into the area of like really spooky stuff, you know, horror movie type stuff. I've not, like I said, I've never heard of anything like that ever, ever. But um, um, I've known several young porters being scared because the dead bodies do things that they don't expect, like they sometimes moan and groan while you're moving them around. This is to do with rigor mortis and the vocal cords and things like that. And they, uh, occasionally they like twitch. And it's, 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 all, it's all like a, It's just because they're galvanized. It's, it's like a, a post-mortem kind of thing. It's not... It's not because they're zombies or anything. But I do, a couple of young young guys who just died, you know, used to run screaming from the department at certain times. And, um, 
uh, sometimes we used to play tricks on people and I won't talk about that because I I, 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 t I did my own part in this kind of banter and I'm not proud of myself because well people used to play tricks on me when I started out and it's, I didn't really appreciate the funny side of it at the time it was only later on I suppose this all comes from the fact that hospital porter is male dominated I mean there, there, there's no real kind of like profession now there, well there are few, very few professions where sort of men can bond on a you know, kind of non-gay way I mean you can't even the armed forces doesn't have this anymore now but if you want to go into a job where you have sort of like non-gay male bonding unfortunately the only way to do it is to do an unglamorous dirty low pay job like, your know, hospital portrait is still 95% male and feminists don't mind they don't mind because it is a dirty un it's low paid it's unglamorous it's low status well, obviously I don't think it's low status I think it's the highest status job of all but most people don't agree with me you see it's conventionally it's regarded as low status <clears throat> um, but you know when, when lads do get together we do bond in this way the odd rib tickler does inevitably emerge and it's only later when you get used to it you don't you, you can see the funny side of it okay guys um a new year i actually tweeted at mick jagger i uh, tweeted happy new year fellow hospital porter i don't know he, he didn't see it i don't think he, didn't, he certainly didn't like it or retweet it but um you see what happened was that an article I'd, i always heard rumors that mick jagger used to be one of us um, it wasn't confirmed. I mean, other people have been, you know, there's other people uh, such as Ludwig, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, Peter Mayhew, people like that. They are one of us, they're former hospital porters. But um, I could never confirm it whether, whether Mick Jagger could be included in that, but it, apparently he was. Now, there was an article in NME, New Musical Express, this is like the go to one-stop shop for all kinds of gossip in the music industry it has been since 1952 um, it has this article here which I with a really horrible title 28 boring day jobs music musicians did before they were famous uh, I've got to, I'll just read it out because that's not only that's very uh, that's deeply patronizing it's deeply ignorant um, but it's also untrue I mean for n nearly everyone I know who's expressed an opinion who's been a hospital porter I've only known a... I don't think I've ever heard a single person say it was boring. Other words they use are fun, satisfying, interesting, inspiring, involving, stressful, challenging, frightening and tiring. But boring, never. But anyway, it says here, Mick Jagger, hospital porter. Jagger worked part-time as a porter at the Bexley Psychiatric Hospital when he was 18 years old. An unlikely place for romance. Legendary Lothario, legendary Lothario Mick actually lost his virginity in the hospital to a nurse in a store cupboard. Well, I personally doubt very much that Mick Jagger lost his virginity at 18. He probably lost it long before then. Um, besides, watch, I don't know a single HP who does not have uh, tall stories to tell about involving sexual escapades with nurses and store cupboards. Now, every uh, every drunk refuse porter propping up the bar and the social club used to do that. Now Bexley Hospital actually closed in September 2001. Um, it's been demolished and redeveloped. Now portering in acute psychiatric care is a very very different kettle of fish to general portering. It's um, it's almost an entirely different profession really. It needs totally different skills and aptitude. Um, I was actually in my uh, I was actually in general service the whole time. I, I never did psychiatric. Um, as a general porter, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do. But um, so that's uh, there, there. You have it. Mick Jagger was one of us, and in future, I am going to have to salute him and call him my brother porter. You know, that's I'm proud. He's a he's someone he's someone very very he's someone admirable. I think, and it's good. You know, there's been some horrible people who hospital porters. Jimmy Savile. You know. Um, so when I find out that someone admirable and decent and clever and talented is a, what used to be a hospital porter, let alone when they still are, you know, I, I jump for joy. Well, uh, my journey to hand out the St Theo's flyer for another year is over. Um, I do hope to see as many people as possible there on Friday. Everyone's welcome. If you're watching this video, just come along if you like, if you're in the area. You'll be very welcome. Um, it's actually 10 years 
now this year since I was kicked out of hospital portering. Um, and I've done, I did an article about that back in January, which I won't talk about now. But what I will say, along with the reunion on Friday, on St Theo's Day itself, that is Wednesday, the 1st of June, there will be a special live episode of The Gas Banner on Hapanwo Radio, and it'll be a live Q&A, so people can... Uh, I'll be doing a sort of portrait and AMA for anyone who wants to take part and has any hospital portering questions to ask me. I'll be uh, going through a few uh, interesting tidbits as well, and uh, generally having a bit of St Theo good cheer. So I do hope you can make that. Keep a look out in the, uh, on the Hapanwo Radio blog for details of that. I will be posting it actually probably before I upload this video. So uh, it's, it'll probably be there now. The notice will give instructions on how you can join in with the live programme. Uh, so uh, anyway, whatever you're doing, if, if I don't see you there in the chat box for that, or I don't see you on Friday, whatever you're doing, whether you're a hospital porter or not, I want to wish you all a very, very happy St. Theo's Day. Hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the New World Order. So I'm not sure exactly how the porters of today would have coped with that, going along those winding country lanes, uh, with people sometimes just carrying them in your bare hands, maybe over your shoulder, something like that. Mind you, there's something St. Theo didn't have to put up with. He didn't come around a corner and there'd be some stuck-up little bitch nurse going, excuse me, you can't just go around that corner without asking, please. Or sour-faced feminist nurse going, mm, you're doing that wrong, do, 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 don't look at me like that, I don't like being looked at like that, or something like that, or some stuck-up manager or something 